uh, one of the world's most influential economists. He's here with me in the studio now. You don't really need any introduction, do you? Mr. Nouriel Roubini, thanks so much for coming in. So I want to start by asking you about the latest developments. Angela Merkel has shown a willingness to lower interest rates for emergency loans sought by Greece and Ireland. Just how much of a turnaround is this by her? Well, it's a positive. It signals that the German realized that they need to help the periphery of the Eurozone. But in my view, the fundamental problems of the periphery are not going to be resolved by having a lower interest rates on the official loan. You know, Greece has a public debt is going to be soon 150 percent of GDP. The Irish banks are in big trouble and putting their liabilities on the balance sheet of the government makes the government insolvent. So you need something much more fundamental. In Greece you need an orderly but coercive restructure of the public debt. In Ireland you need to convert uh, that debt and secure claims of the banks into equity as a way of recapitalizing the banks. So you need debt restructuring both in the public and the private sector. That's much more radical than reducing the interest rate on the loans of the IMF or the EU. So what do you want to see then from the meeting that's taking place today and of course that crucial meeting at the end of this month, March 25th? Well, they're going to move in the right direction, but whatever they're going to do, in my view, is going to be too little, too late. You have to extend the official resources. You have to deal with how to restore competitiveness and growth. You have to restructure private and public debt. So in my view, there is not going to be a comprehensive plan that resolves the problems of the periphery of the Eurozone, especially the excessive amounts of private and public debts. So they're going to kick the can down the road, then the markets are going to react negatively and they'll have to do more somewhere down the line. So these are chronic problems are going to take many years to resolve. The idea you're going to be resolving them in March with an agreement that is uh, far-fetched. But I guess that particularly since Spain's downgrade the pressure is really on for them to come up with a comprehensive solution. You say the markets are going, going to react negatively if they don't. Tell me more about that. What happens if they don't come up with a solution? Well, you know, Greece and Ireland have already lost market access. In my view, Portugal is a clear case of a country that's going to lose market access and need an MFEU program. The big question is uh, the big elephant in the room is Spain, a country that is on one side too big to fail, but also too big to be saved, meaning if they lose market access, there is not enough EFSF resources today to backstop both the sovereign and the banks for the next three years. And the question is, can they at least agree to have <coughs> enough EFSF resources much larger as a way to avoiding a self-fulfilling run on Spain? And then the jury on that one is still open because after the elections in Germany and other ones this month, the political pressure on Merkel might be to compromise domestic less. Pressure. The domestic pressure is going to say, we're already bailing out uh, the lazy Greeks and so on. Why should we do more for everybody else? So you, you, you alluded to a funding crisis there for Spain. Tell me what will happen at the end of this month or beyond. What are the markets going to look like? Are we looking at a meltdown? Well, I'm not thinking about the funding crisis in the very short run in the case of Spain. What I'm saying is that if there are not larger enough resources at the official level and the country were to lose market access in the next year, then you'll have a significant problem. And just to avoid a self-fulfilling run on the sovereign, on the financial system, you have to have an envelope of official resources that says if that country is too big to fail and too big to be saved, were to lose market access, then there is enough money to backstop them. There's enough money to backstop Greece, Ireland and Portugal, but not for Spain. So a condition is necessary but not sufficient to avoid a run or a loss of market access to have at least official money is enough to backstop that country. Well, the Bank of Spain has said that uh, banks are looking at uh, around 15 billion euros worth of shortfall, 21 billion dollars of capital. What do you make of that? How high do you think it'll be? Well, you no know, private sector estimate, including one that my, my research firm suggests that the cost of recapitalizing Spanish banks are going to be much larger than the Spanish government is estimating. In yeah. our baseline, we see uh, potential losses of uh, you know 80 billion euro plus in extreme scenario could be twice as much of course, so you're looking at more than uh, what Moody's was, was saying yesterday 40 50 billion yeah yeah and of course they have dynamic provisioning so of the some of the money is aside to recapitalize them but certainly the view is that the losses are going to be significant and therefore the fiscal cost of backstop in the financial system are going to be larger than what the government is suggesting and while all this is going on, the ECB talking about raising rates next month, what is that going to mean 
for those peripheral indebted countries? It's going to make things worse. First of all, they're going to raise month uh, rates not just next month, but in my view, they're going to raise them three times this year, 75 basis points. The other periphery is still contracting in terms of output in Greece, in Ireland, in Spain, or barely growing in Italy and Portugal. It's going to mean that growth is going to become worse. Competitiveness is going to become worse. The pressure on the southern is going to become worse. And the pressure on financial institutions is going to become worse. So in my view, that decision is mistaken, is too, too soon to be made, given there is a fundamental weakness of the periphery of the Eurozone. And inflation is just barely above the target of the ECB. So they could make a mistake the same way they made a mistake uh, in the summer of 08, when oil prices were rising and they started to worry about inflation. But that's and the then, problem, isn't it? That they would argue oil prices are rising, inflation is ticking up, they have to hike rates. Well, first of all, core inflation in the Eurozone is still uh, well lower, below 1%, like in the United States. The headline is going up, but some of it is level effect. And given the slack in the goods yeah. and the labor market, the risk that from a first round you get the second round effect through wages is significantly limited yeah. in the Eurozone. So in my view, it would be better to wait a few months and see whether inflation goes higher significantly or just stabilizes. And tightening too early implies that the recession in the periphery is going to get worse, and the financial and the debt problems of the periphery are going to get even worse. So Europe risks, what, a, a Japan-style lost decade? Certainly, in the periphery of the Eurozone, uh, fiscal austerity, structural reform, lack of competitiveness implies either continued recession or very, very anemic economic growth. Could be a longer term near depression of the sort that we saw in the Japan in the 1990s. There is that a number of those countries in the periphery of the Eurozone are facing. Now, on the subject of, of Japan, I want to ask you about our breaking news that we've been covering all morning. I mean, you can see incredible pictures right there of the Cosmo oil refinery going up in flames this after they've seen what their biggest earthquake ever. What do you think the economic fallout is going to be from this? Uh, we don't know yet because we don't know yet the severity, even if it looks like a very serious earthquake. In the short run, whenever you have shocks like this, there was an earthquake in Kobe in Japan in 95. Mm. You have a weakening of economic activity because suddenly capital stock is destroyed, people die or cannot work or go to work, there's damage to supply and the productive capacity. So you have a slowdown in output in the same quarter, mm. but then over time, if there is a massive amount of fiscal stimulus to rebuild infrastructure, you name it, there could be an economic recovery over the mid term. But certainly it's a negative for their stock market, given there is a destruction of wealth, and also the kind of effects on con confidence are going to be significant. And let's not forget there'll be also fiscal stimulus to reconstruct, but Japan already has a budget deficit close to 10% of GDP, public debt of 180% of GDP, aging of population. So this is certainly the worst thing can happen in Japan at the worst time. You know what? It was really great to talk to you, Mr. Nuriel Rubini. Thank you so much for coming in. Pleasure Come being in with again. you.